Just before 9 a.m. Tuesday, November the 13th, 1849, two figures could be seen silhouetted against the sky atop Horsemonger Lane Jail, which once stood on this land. Beside the two figures on the squat building's roof stood a scaffold. Those about to meet their fate were husband and wife, Frederick and Marie Manning. The two had gotten married just a couple of years earlier, promising each other until death do us part. Little could they have known that the death that would lead to their ultimate separation was that of the victim who fell foul of their insatiable greed. Marie Manning was born Marie de Rue in Lausanne, Switzerland in 1821. Her parents were fervent Catholics who believed their daughter's future lay in a nunnery. However, Marie thought otherwise and a way out presented itself in the form of a bandit named Montano. He whisked the young Marie off to his gang's abandoned mansion in the Swiss Alps where the pair lived a life of crime. Well, not exactly. While some stories about this case includes this tale from Marie's early life, these wild yarns were likely invented after the fact by overzealous writers such as Robert Hirsch, who was described as being an unscrupulous scribbler. In actuality, not much is known about Marie's early life in Switzerland. What we do know is that her parents passed away when she was a teenager and she emigrated to England, finding work in Devon as a lady's maid for Lady Anna Polk, the wife of MP Sir Lawrence Polk. Later, she moved to London and worked for the Duchess of Sutherland's daughter, Lady Blantyre, here at her lavish home, Stafford House. Living and working amid such elegance and frippery soon imparted on Marie a taste for the finer things in life. To return to the comparative squalor of her early life was unthinkable. In addition to her taste for luxury, Marie, or Maria as she was sometimes known, was described as a charismatic young woman with a magnetic personality and good looks. She definitely did not have any shortage of admirers. This initially flattering situation would eventually turn deadly. In 1846, it was claimed that Marie was set to rendezvous with her mistress in Boulogne, France. While on board a ship crossing the channel, she met Irishman Patrick O'Connor. There were immediate sparks between the two, despite O'Connor being some 20 years her senior. Patrick was a man of independent means a crooked customs inspector who combined smuggling with money lending to build himself quite the fortune. This excited the young servant. In the end, Patrick promised Marie that he would take her out as soon as he returned to London. Other reports from the Times state that Patrick and Marie were already well acquainted by this point, with the pair having an on-again, off-again romance. One thing that is certain, however, is that Patrick had a rival for Marie's affection, a man named Frederick Manning. He was a London native and closer to his lover's age, and while he worked as a guard for a railway company, he was set to inherit a fortune from his mother. It's likely that the pair also met during Marie's travels with her mistress. Both men often gloated to friends that they were set to meet their lover at the prestigious Stafford House. Among many other dignitaries, Queen Victoria herself was a regular visitor to the stately home. However, Fred and Patrick's visits were strictly confined to the servants' quarters. Marie knew the situation with her lovers couldn't last forever, and she wanted to settle down with the man who would keep her living the lifestyle she had become accustomed to. She believed Patrick was that man, though letters she wrote to him showed her growing frustration that he had still not proposed to her. In 1847, with Patrick dallying, Fred seized the opportunity and popped the question himself. He assured Marie that he would inherit a fortune on his mother's death, enough for the pair to live very comfortably. With this assurance, Marie accepted the proposal and the pair were married in St. James's Church in Piccadilly. 
Understandably, Patrick did not attend the wedding, though he did send the blushing bride a letter shortly after the ceremony. In it, he declared his eternal love for her and claimed he had been about to propose before she said yes to Fred. Of course, we do not know if Patrick was telling the truth, but his words did not help the new union. Perhaps that had been the point. The newlyweds received a further setback when Frederick lost his job with Great Western. While we do not know precisely why he was given the boot, it seems there was suspicion that he may have been involved in a robbery. Though not enough evidence was found to charge him with the crime, he was nevertheless discharged. Marie would have believed that the pair would be settled and starting a family by this stage. Instead, they were now searching for a way to make a living. They eventually decided their best option was to return to Fred's hometown of Taunton, where they used their savings to buy the White Hart pub. This was a far cry from the lifestyle Marie had imagined for herself, and things got worse when rumours began circulating around town that Fred had been seeing other women. She had apparently also been seeing Patrick, staying with him on several occasions. Whatever the state of the Manning's relationship, it was put under further stress at the beginning of 1849. Two train robberies had taken place on the Great Western Line between Plymouth and London. The perpetrators were two men, Henry Poole and Edward Nightingale. Poole was good friends with Frederick, and it was discovered he and Nightingale had stayed at the White Hart the night before the job. While the investigation found the Mannings played no part in the crime, some newspapers claimed that the police had received a tip-off about the robberies. The finger was pointed firmly in Marie's direction, with it being thought that she had sought Poole's arrest as proxy revenge for Fred's infidelities. The pub's connection to the crime and talk of Marie being a snitch led to dwindling business at the White Hart. Because of this, the pair would eventually move back to London where, for a time, they would run a pub called the King John's Head, though this would also prove unsuccessful. Eventually, the couple made their home at 3 Miniver Place, Bermondsey, South East London. There, they let out rooms to make ends meet. By now, Marie had realised that Fred had been lying to her about his inheritance, specifically how much money there was. Not as much as Marie had been told, that was for sure. Patrick regularly visited Number 3 Miniver Place and occasionally lodged there. By this point, Frederick had become a heavy drinker and O'Connor feared he would one day come home drunk and confront him. This turbulent love triangle between Marie and her lovers would reach its tragic conclusion in August 1849. Despite his dalliances with smuggling and extortion, Patrick O'Connor was rarely absent from his day job working on London docks. So when he failed to show up two days in a row, alarm bells began to ring. More so for one man in particular, his cousin and workmate, William Flynn. After finishing his duties, William decided to investigate. He spoke with two of Patrick's friends at his lodgings. They explained that they last saw Patrick on Thursday when he told them he would be having dinner with his girl, Marie. William then spoke with the landlady who told him that Marie Manning had visited Patrick's apartment on Thursday and Friday evenings, but she had not seen Patrick with her. William did not need to hear any more. He was sure something had happened, so he contacted the police. Authorities arrived at the Manning residence the following day. They found Marie home alone. She told them Patrick had never come for dinner on Thursday and that she had only visited that evening and Friday to see if he was ill. When police asked about the whereabouts of Fred, Marie said her husband was at church and added that they had plans that evening so the house would be empty if the police decided to pay another visit. Nevertheless, three days after Patrick's disappearance, William arrived at the Manning's home with a police officer. There, 
Marie told him the same story. She had not seen Patrick. William did not buy it. Even more convinced that something terrible had happened to his cousin, he began to give out leaflets promising a £10 reward for any information. Still, it was not until he searched Patrick's apartment that he began to fear the worst. There, he discovered securities and cash that he knew Patrick kept on hand were missing. He believed Marie was somehow involved, but before she could be questioned further, she fled from her home on Minerva Place with luggage and tow. The contents of the house had also been sold. A manhunt was launched and at the same time, the police decided to take another look around the Manning's house, even though the initial search had turned up nothing. They dug up the back garden, but came back empty handed. However, on Friday, someone noticed that their flagstones in the kitchen had been scrubbed clean. Upon closer inspection, it seemed that they had been recently relayed. They decided to remove the stones and dig at the disturbed earth. They didn't have to dig far. At roughly a foot deep, they discovered the naked body of Patrick O'Connor, covered in quicklime. He had been shot and bludgeoned. Exactly what had happened on the evening of August the 9th was only known by those present at the time. Patrick, Marie and Fred. But in a supposed confession, Frederick would later state that Marie had been behind the murder. He claims she was angry at O'Connor as he owed her money for three weeks of lodgings. He had also apparently been the main reason she had decided to take on the King John's head pub, which had lost the couple some £100. That equates to some £16,000 today. She wanted his money and revenge. Marie then set about regularly inviting O'Connor over for food and drink and visiting him at weekends so they'd appear to be on good terms. During the many visits, it said that O'Connor commented on the hole gradually being dug in the kitchen, but was told it was simply plumbing work. On the night of the murder, he had arrived at the Manning's home as he had done many times before. Marie claimed they were expecting guests and told O'Connor to wash his hands. He initially refused, but she insisted. As he stood at the sink, she placed one hand on his shoulder and lifted a pistol to his head with the other before pulling the trigger. Frederick goes on to say that she then raced to him and said, quote, Thank God. I have made him good at last. It never will be found out. As we are on such exceedingly good terms, no one will ever have the least suspicion of my murdering him. End quote. When Fred went to see what his wife had done, he apparently found O'Connor still alive, groaning on the floor. It seems not enough gunpowder was used, or the caliber was too small, as while the bullet had fractured O'Connor's skull, it hadn't pierced it. Instead, it had slid around to below his eyebrow. Mr. Manning then states he picked up a crowbar and finished him off. The pair then stripped and buried the body beneath the kitchen floor. How much truth is to be found in Fred's confession is debatable. Still, it's true that Marie went to Patrick's house over the following two days and collected his railway share certificates, cash, and other valuables. Despite now having everything they desired, the gravity of their actions and the position they now found themselves in began to weigh heavily on the murderous couple. What remained of their relationship quickly evaporated as each became suspicious of the other. As police began sniffing around, the pressure became too much, and Marie fled to Scotland with most of their stolen goods. Soon after, Fred realised he had been left behind and sold all the furniture in their home before fleeing to Jersey. Marie was the first of the pair to be captured. During her escape, she had left several boxes at London Bridge Station. These contained blood-stained clothes along with letters sent between herself and Patrick. Keeping a low profile didn't come naturally for Marie, and it was soon found that she had purchased first-class tickets to Edinburgh. Police in London quickly alerted their counterparts in Scotland via telegraph. 
Authorities there already had their eye on the fugitive as she had been trying to convert some of the shares that had been reported stolen into cash. A week after her escape, Marie Manning was arrested. Fred took slightly longer to track down. Though he had travelled to Jersey with plans to move on to France, he had instead begun drowning his sorrows on the island. An acquaintance on the journey over had recognised him and informed police of his location after reading of Patrick's death. On August 30th, Frederick Manning was arrested and immediately laid the blame at the feet of his wife, saying he was entirely innocent. By this point, newspapers had already dubbed the case the Bermondsey Horror and delighted in the thought of how many issues the story of a female murderer with links to the aristocracy would sell. The initial inquest into events revealed that Fred had had disturbing conversations with a medical student who lodged at their home. During these, he asked about the effects of chloroform and if a drugged person could sign a check if asked. It was also shown that Mrs. Manning had purchased the lime and a shovel. At the time, a wife couldn't be charged as an accessory after the fact for murders carried out by their husband as wives were bound to loyally follow their spouses. However, if she had been involved in the planning or taken part, that's a different story. The Manning's trial took place at the Old Bailey on October 25th and 26th. It was initially argued that the jury should contain people of French or Swiss descent so as to be fair to Marie. This idea was thrown out as it was said that her marriage to Fred made her an English citizen. Ultimately, it would take these jury members 45 minutes to find Frederick and Marie Manning guilty of murder. Before passing sentence, the judge asked the pair if they had anything to say. Fred remained silent, but the usually calm and collected Marie launched into a tirade, stating, There is no justice for a foreign subject in this country. She continued to plead her innocence as the judge gave the inevitable sentence of death. The former servant even attempted to use her connections to procure a royal pardon, but the letters she sent went unanswered. After the trial, the murderous couple would be kept apart, though they exchanged several letters, each beseeching the other to confess. I address you as a fellow sinner and a fellow sufferer, and not as my wife, since the contract must be considered as cancelled, extending as it does only until death and not beyond it, and both of us standing as we do on the brink of eternity. I implore of you to be truthful in all you utter. I address you as my husband. I am far away from my happy native land on account of this contract and this land which you have made to me a captivity. All I have to beg of you now is to state facts, as you know that I was not in the house when O'Connor met with his death. In the end, neither backed down from their version of events, and on November the 13th, 1849, they were united one last time in the chapel of the Horsemonger Lane Jail. The condemned pair shared a few words, kissed and embraced. They were then led out onto the rooftop where the scaffold had been erected. Newspapers claimed some 30,000 people had turned out to watch the spectacle. Among them was one, Charles Dickens, who had turned up to watch the crowd. He would later write of the barbarous nature of those present. While Fred averted his gaze from these onlookers as he stood beneath the noose, Marie opted to be blindfolded as she was led to her fate. Moments later, the couple dropped through the trap door, parted by death. Thank you for watching. Right then, take care and I'll see you next time with another story to make you say, well, I never.